Hey, everybody, welcome to Big Glenn Radio's Way Back When History Show. Uh, you know, we love to talk about women's empowerment. And today we're going to be talking about that with author Galia Gishon. Uh, she's going to talk about her brand new historical fiction novel. It's called The Accidental Suffragist. And, uh, you know, it really does connect from then until now. And um, her work that she does as well also is about empowering women um, financially, that we understand our finances so that we can be empowered to live the best life we can. So I encourage you to go to her website. It's GaliaGishonAuthor.com. Did I pronounce that correctly? And welcome, yep. Galia. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa and Nancy, for having me here today. Yeah, so this, this is exciting because, you know, we're talking about historical fiction and, you know, women... I don't know if it's just we keep interviewing uh, women about women in history, but I think we really have to look at women of the past and what they have done and the sacrifices they have made for us women today. Because it's like if we even close our eyes for a second, we lose a little bit of power every single time. Yeah. And I feel that even now, you know, we've come a long way, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think that too like in a good way especially as you know a mother with two teenage daughters like I want to keep inspiring our youth and inspiring mm -hmm. women around us and when you see how difficult it was for these women mm -hmm. you know some of the characters in my book or other women I actually look at that as inspirational because like very often we're like oh I don't have time for this or I don't have the will or the inclination you're like well look at what these women did they exactly even more challenges and more obstacles mm -hmm. and it was you know probably insurmountable that, that you know financial or political or whatnot and they did it and they didn't mm. think twice about it they just did it so that's my hope yeah. to be more inspirational and give us the motivation and the inspiration to continue i think we need mm -hmm. it because it's actually you know and i think your book gets into this with your character helen um when you decide to stand up for something which when it's for women, we're standing up for ourselves and our mothers, our daughters, you know, like you're saying, your sisters, cousins, right. um, friends, you are going to get negative feedback. You're going to get people mm -hmm. who come and don't understand. I mean, right now, if you look at, you know, just over the last four or five years in, in our country, we've, you know, feeling that whiplash of, you know, so on social media, people are just having these huge arguments yeah. and it gets political, but mm -hmm. I just stop with the political let's just look at can we look at what is right for women you know right. women's bodies and yeah. so no matter what whenever you make a stand you're going to get it <laughs> someone's coming after you somebody's going to say something that you don't like well and, and just, you know, one thing that i thought that is very typical of women or people in general that my character had is very few of us are so passionate like most of us like are interested Mm. But we also have our lives. We have our work, our families. Mm -hmm. but very few of us are like, no, 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 I'm so... And this character, like, it was important to her, but it wasn't her whole life initially. Like, she, you know, got into it accidentally or... But, you know, think about things that are important to us. Like, I know a lot, like, the environment is important to me, but I'm, am I an environmental activist? No. Do I eat vegan? No. Like, but it's important to me. Like, there's a lot of things mm. that we... Causes that we believe in, but are we, like, sacrificing our lives for? No. So but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be a priority. Mm, right. Yeah. So let's, let's go to the beginning of, of you writing this. Cause I know you've written, you know, you've got your financial books um, you know, and, and you're kicking butt on TV and all kinds of things. Um, so yeah. and we'll touch on that a little bit later too, but going into writing, you know, fiction, Nancy's starting to read it and she's like, yeah. Holy crap, man. <laughs> what yeah, no, it's, well, your, your main character it reminds me of my grandmother. And my grandmother was a little four foot nine lady from, from England. But what a spitfire. She was very quiet, but when something happened, she was on it and she always put her hands on her hips and like, it's not gonna turn out the way you want. You know? <laughs> she had that little spitfire strength and your character reminds me, like, I think she's going there like that. Yeah, yeah. she. What I wanted, and I, I wanted to show how strong she got during the book. Mm -hmm. And so much of her strength came from grief initially, mm -hmm. but then she realized how important this was. And she yeah. did, and especially at the end, which I'm not going to give it away, but yeah, because I'm really, not done yet. 
<laughs> okay. The end is really, and by the way, the end is an absolute surprise. I mean, you know what happens. The amendment gets passed, obviously, but just in terms of some of the things that happen at the end, which are true, um, she finds strength that she didn't know she had. She really mm -hmm. did. And she was forced to find it. She was forced to confront it. But she was, she was quiet strength. Like she wasn't the loudest one. She wasn't, you know, the, the, the mouthpiece. And I purposely did that because very few of us are the loud ones. Right. Most of us are really just the, the quieter ones or the ones who are wait and see. And, but she becomes so strong to, to see that strength in her. I actually, like after a while, I just assumed she was alive and she was a real character. <laughs> well, in, in a way she is, you know, because she embodies so many different women. Yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about where, you know, where she was at this time frame, because there was a fire. Was this a real fire that happened? Because there, I know there were a lot of things at that time frame. Yeah, so it's interesting because literally I was just interviewed, like I said, by my library this morning. So they actually brought up the fire. So the Triangle Shirtwaist um, fire was, so first of all, I love historical fiction. I read it so mm. much as a kid myself. And so mm. for whatever reason, I, I knew a lot about the Triangle Shirtwaist fire. I read a lot about mm. the teen. I don't know why. And I think it's, on one hand, people, a lot of people know about it, but then I've had that question too, Lisa. They're like, is that, did that really happen? Um, I lived in New York City for 20 years. It's kind of a deep rooted in New York City history because of all oh. the government sweatshops that were downtown. Mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, 120 plus girls died in one fire because the doors were locked. I mean, it's just yeah. it's an absolute it's terrible thing that happened. Um, separately, yes. I, I, I wrote a lot of this book in, in writing classes, which is like, I cannot, express enough what a what a huge how people should t attend writing classes it mm. makes a huge difference on many accounts I'll get into that mm. um but when I was writing the book and I wrote it I've written over a few years in the iterations like I felt like it's a little bit the formula but you need a little bit of like a hook like mm. you need something like in the beginning to really get you hooked on mm -hmm. and I thought well how would Helen have gotten involved as a suffragist they're mostly wealthy women like it wouldn't have been a natural like oh let me just you know become a suffragist like that wasn't common yeah so I was looking for like I hate to say it, like a tragedy or something terrible that happened and that did happen so when I was doing my research I was like oh yeah the triangle shirt waist and truthfully suffragists were there because they went to rescue the women to some extent mm. wow and so what was it that made her stand up and say, okay, now I'm going to do something. What was that, uh, well, that spark? I shouldn't say that when we're talking about fires. Yeah, I think that the, so, you know, a little bit of the historical part is that the suffragists went to the fire and they said, okay, it's a little bit of a domino effect. If we can vote, you know, so much of this happened because the politicians are not passing the laws mm -hmm. that protect the labor, you know, just mm -hmm. which we have now, the child labor laws, like those laws mm -hmm. weren't in effect. And they're like, but we can't even vote for the politicians to pass those laws. So that was really right. one of the causes of the suffragist movement. I mean, it's obviously started in with Susan B. Anthony in the 1850s, but even back then in the 1910, 1911, 1912, when this happened, they're like, we can't even vote for the politicians. We can't even support the politicians because we don't have the right to vote. Yet our children are working in the factories. Yeah. Talk about having absolutely no control and mm -hmm. feeling so, so out of control and feeling so helpless. And so they were, the two movements were intertwined. The suffragists wanting to help the labor union and the child labor laws. Um, and most of the women who were working were either domestic help or were working in factories. So it kind of made sense that Helen was working in a factory and they needed the money. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. when I was like, okay, well, if the suffragists hire her, she'll have a little more money. And she really did it initially just as a job because let's face it, most of us do things initially for the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a luxury Gotta, to do yeah, that yeah. for passion or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But most of us work because we have to, and we're working yeah. to support ourselves and our families. That's right. And then when you do start stepping out of in and standing up for something, it starts to kind of take away from you earning the money, and you put yourself in a position. And do I mean it's like these tweets are not mine. <laughs> they are mine, but they, they, are, they are not the company I'm working for. Okay. You know, opinions are my own. And so you, you, mm. you really can, you know, hurt yourself financially by standing up. Oh, I, we know I, somebody who lost her job for some of the tweets she put online and she got fired. And you're saying, if you keep talking that way, it won't be surprising if you get fired. And she did. 
right? So, you know, and she's talking bad about her boss online. I mean, that's a little bit out of line. Yeah. Not, not the smartest thing to do. And I well, think. And I, I, I doggy. She, she, she you got a dog. A dog is barking. I see a doggy. <laughs> <laughs> I love a doggy. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. You can't get fired, but yeah, I mean, you've got to you when you stand up, you stand up. Well, and and that was also what I showed in the book because she had to defend herself to her neighbors. Mm -hmm. She definitely had to defend herself to her husband, to some extent to her children. So she was constantly fighting, mm. she was constantly standing up for herself because she's the more and more that she got into the the suffragist movement, the more she didn't fit into her life. Mm -hmm. She often wasn't a factory worker, you know, she, it, it was like they, they viewed it as a luxury also that she was able to vote for or work with the suffragists and to vote for, you know, work for the right to vote, like how fortunate you are. And she realized after a while, she didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. This is so all that's it. Yeah. If you don't, you're really not going to make the money you, you need or want. But, but she also wasn't one of the um, well, more well off. No, no, she no, did not have money. And at one point she, um, you know, is, is afraid that she's, she is afraid that she's pregnant. And all of a sudden she's like, I can't be pregnant. And he's like, oh my gosh, what is that going to do to me? Mm. I won't be able to work or I won't be able to work the way I want to work. Mm. So that was all of a sudden just like another reality of life. Like being, you know, those women at the time didn't have birth control as much. Or, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, now we're, <laughs> we're still fighting all of that. <laughs> yes, that's a know. separate discussion, though, right? <laughs> it's always yeah. It's 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 we're always still fighting for the right and control of our bodies, <laughs> which is still you know there. So it's it's interesting. And now, how how did her husband feel? I haven't got to that part, but how does her husband feel in regards to her being a suffragist? I, was he supportive of women being able to vote? It's funny because I get a lot of questions about him. Um, mm. You know, I, I had to make a lot of choices in how I wrote him. So I could have written him as like just a total misogynist, macho, you know, macho is probably the wrong word. They didn't have macho back then, but just as like a very like stereotypical caricature of a man, like no Helen, you can't do that. You can't, you can't. But I didn't want to, because I think that most men weren't like that. They were maybe more traditional or sign of their times, but I don't think he was a jerk. But then I don't, I didn't want him to be all wishy-washy, like, no, Helen, of course you can do all that, because that wasn't realistic either. Yeah. Like, she had to get his permission. That was just a fact back then. Women had to get their husband's permission. It's amazing, I huh? I know. It's crazy. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> He, yeah. didn't, she, he didn't have to sign anything saying she could be a suffragist <laughs> i mean he didn't have to sign it because they didn't do that uh, yeah she, but but I, when she wanted to go to washington no. she had to get his permission to go to washington um wow yeah, so it was it was a, she, a lot of permission for and when she even wanted to take the job she had to get his permission to take the job mm. do that and she couldn't do it until she, he gave her his permission yeah it's like when we lived in kenya I went in to open a bank account and the banker said, well, where is your husband? And I'm like, I'm not married. I want to open a bank account. He goes, well, you can't. I'm like, what? It never occurred to me to even ask that question before moving there. I've been to Kenya three times leading towards, but I had no idea that, that, that you could not, as a female back then, open a bank account. So I had to go out on the street and find a man and fortunately, I found a lawyer and he was walking down the street and, and he was white because you wouldn't want to, as a white woman, bring in some black guy that you don't know and say, this is my husband. That opens up a whole other drama over there oh, from both sides, the white and from, the black side. Yeah, so I saw this white guy and I, I explained what was wrong and he was very nice and I ended up working for him, but he... He came in and stood behind me at the bank and, and said he gave his permission for me to open my own bank account. It was like the weirdest thing. But so I can kind of, I get the feeling of, of that era from having lived in Kenya as a single female. That's, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, well, you got to think in, in westernization, oh, Kenya is a little slower on the westernization part. I mean, it was still colonial mm -hmm. times. And so 
it, yeah, it's just switched over. Yeah, it had just switched, you know, and then like in yeah. South Africa, when we lived there, Nancy, when, I think with, oh. when we first moved there, Nancy went into a restaurant. It was, you know, I think we just got there and she got asked to leave because it was for men only. And she, mm-hmm. over then, and back in those days, there were, you know, whites here, blacks there. So the apartheid was in full sign of time, but women were also part of that. It wasn't just whether you were a white or a black woman, all women, this is for men only. They had their own places. And so that was an awakening, which has now changed. You know, things do get better. (laughs) They do. And it 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 only gets gets better for standing up for those issues and standing up for what's right. You know, there, um, I think, even in this country, a woman couldn't get a credit card in her own name until the 70s. Wow. 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 So this really does tie back to what you do on the financial yes. level. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, at the beginning, I was talking about this. You really work with women um, through your books, uh, you know, all the speaking engagements and workshops that you do that if you have financial power. Right. And I think it's financial things. independence. That's the end. Like, yeah, independence, independence is a good better word. That you're not married or you're not in a partnership. Like I'm not espousing that women need to be single and it's 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 creating choices mm. yeah like, let me choose what i want to do mm-hmm. and have the independence to do it right whether it's i'm in a partnership i'm married i'm single i want to work i don't want to work how do i want to work and we how do we to not have those choices is is like a prison right? yeah. that's kind of interesting because you know even today you'll see you know, a woman will get married and the husband runs the checkbook and they'll be working. And Nancy, that happened. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's that um, the donor took all her money. (laughs) The donor, (laughs) you know, he, he, but women lose their, I think you lose your identity when you, if you're working and, you know, creating this income and then you're kind of left out of that decision making someone else is holding the checkbook and here's your cash mm-hmm. I mean it wasn't that long ago that women you know it, yeah. here's here's your shopping money dear and you're only allowed to buy this right right and believe it or not I had a f- person in my town who was told she couldn't shop at certain supermarkets because they were too expensive by her husband mm-hmm. this wow. is 2010 or so 20- we're still there yeah mm-hmm. so do you think writing historical fiction it like fiction because it's based on truth, right? Gets people to get the information in this really, it's such historical novels are just the best, man. They really yeah. are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I get asked, why did I write historical fiction? And selfishly, it's what I like to read. Yeah, it's just what yeah. I gravitate towards. Like I'm, you know, at the end of the day, I wanted people to be entertained by this book. Yeah. I want them to learn, obviously, but I'm not a teacher. I want people to be entertained. I want people to read the book and say, oh gosh, you have to read this book. I couldn't put it down. It's, I yeah. love it. Like, that's what I want. I want them to tell their mothers, their sisters, their friends, their, their coworkers. Like, this is a great book. With that being said, like to me, especially with the women's right to vote, like this is a story that we have to, I, I learned when I was researching this book. And here I'm like, consider myself fairly educated, fairly knowledgeable. And there was so much that I didn't know about. Did you geek right. out, like totally geek out on other women? And because there are so many stories like this, that you know, true stories throughout history. And a lot of these women get washed up, like their stories get hidden at the bottom of the museum drawer, you know? Yes. Yeah. You know, so interesting is that my writing teacher is great advice. Um, she said to me, because when I was doing my research, she said, don't read, but look at pictures. Because then you're, if you read someone else's account, whether it's a story or an article, you're going to write it in their voice without thinking about it subconsciously. But if you just look at a picture, so especially when I was looking at how people dressed or the way they were living or the parades or things like that. So I started looking at so many websites and pictures. And I mean, I, I really like, I, it was like a black hole. Like I found myself, okay, golly, you have to stop researching and start writing because mm-hmm. you would. I would, I would look at a picture and I would want to know about their story. And, you know, a lot of them were immigrants. So it was like the Italian immigrants versus the, Indi- oh. um, versus the um, Irish immigrants versus the Jewish immigrants. Like, you know, they all have very different reasons as to why they immigrated and they lived in the Lower East Side. So I, I, I did geek out. I, I would, I, that's, <laughs> Nancy yeah. started writing an historical novel in Kenya uh, mm-hmm. about Kenya and, and when it was in South Africa I was coming home from school and she had a friend give her a huge mm-hmm. newspaper roll 
of paper, newspaper, mm -hmm. and she covered the walls and we did the timeline <laughs> of the world. And so it'd be like in China, they had this over here. They had that because you had to get, we didn't have Google. Right. Right. And it was yeah. a challenge not to write a history book because yeah. I, want, I wanted that's, that's the fictional part. Like I, it was, it would, there was a lot that I didn't write because there were so many different factions. There were so many different suffragist movements. There was like the different states being passed. And I didn't include a lot of that because it's like reading a really true his, um, history book, which nobody mm -hmm. wants to read a history book. It's <laughs> hard to sell history it's to hard. people who don't aren't into history. You know, when we were in South Africa as a kid and, and I would, loved historical novels. That was my thing. And I was 13 years old reading War and Peace and, you know, <laughs> crazy stuff. But it was when we went on tour and I went to the historic sites that I understood what the history I was being taught in school. And when we went, I went back to school after being a Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> um, I, my history grades jumped. It was yeah. basically what I majored in out of high school was history because yeah. of going to places. And so that's kind of where I think it's so important, historical novels, especially, you know, for young girls to get involved. This, I would think this would be a great mm -hmm. novel for a young girl to read <laughs> yes, of all ages, really. Definitely, like, that's absolutely, like the young adult, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could have done more with subject matters that made it not young adult, and I didn't want it to be because I really wanted this to be something that middle schoolers and high schoolers would read as well. Oh, good. Um, I mean, this is the best way to learn history because history can become, depending on who's teaching it and how they teach, can be very dry. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes I remember in school getting, here's a list of all these dates and one line definition of something that happened for each year. And, and then you're going to have a test in two weeks. And it didn't mean anything to me. Right. It's the people. Until I started reading the stories because you need the person behind the story. Right. Mm -hmm. The it's gossip. Something. Yeah, it's, it's gossip. You know, it's to be stale. It's backyard it's gossip. gossip. And I, I started reading all these historical fiction novels the last 10 years, like Paula and McCartney, cool. Fiona Davis, and Christina mm -hmm. um, Baker Klein, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Kristen Hanna and Meg Wolitzer. And it's mm -hmm. like, I just couldn't put him down. I was like, God, yeah. these are such good stories. Like, I'm mm -hmm. really loving them. Yeah. Um, and then you're like, oh, yeah. And I'm learning about what happened in Australia. Or I'm learning about what happened in the library in the yeah. 1910s. Or, mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. That's, yeah, do is. you want this to be a movie? That'd be cool. <laughs> it's so funny you say that because so when my, this is a very like technical question, but when my lawyer was looking at the contract, she said, oh, well, let's talk about the movie and TV rights. And I was like, really? And she's like, oh, yeah, that's how movies get made. They get bought by books. So yes, of course, I would love this to be a movie. Do I think That'd it be would cool. be? I don't know. But That'd be cool. I love the front cover. Yeah, so. yeah. She did a really good job with it. That's my editor um, at the publishing. Um, I couldn't, in, like, when we were, when I got the offer from the publishing, and she said, what, how do you want the cover to look? And I couldn't foresee. I actually initially called mm. it, um, an idea of like the hats because the size of the hats at the time was a little mm. on your bank account. So it's like the big hats were the wealthy women, the small hats were really just more for warmth, the poorer women. Mm. Um, so I was gonna yeah. call it like the hat or the elevated station or, um, and then the accidental suffrage, just that name came about. And oh, then she perfect. came yeah. this yeah. and I was like, that's it, that's the one. <laughs> so, so who would you pick to play Helen in a movie? Oh gosh, who would I pick? Um, you know, maybe someone like a, oh gosh, Emma Stone. Mm. Ooh. Um, mm. And who's the one who just played a? She's an Irish name. She was in Little Women. Oh, she, actually, I would play her to play Alice Paul because I think she has like mm. a very like leader Spitfire. Um, and a Julianne Moore. I love her as an actress. Maybe. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Julian Moore is like one of the top. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. if we're going to make it into a movie. I should have my wish list, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> hey, you know, and I think, you know, we're at that point now with so many places like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, and there's so much potential to have books turned into movies now. Mm -hmm. And at least you should go on Drunk History on the TV show and tell the story. Oh, well, that'd know. be fun. I don't know that. Oh, no, Drunk History? Oh, it's, it's on the comedy history. channel. Derek Waters. So they get celebrities drunk and they have to tell a historical story. 
and then they do a play so using their voice. So you, you see them drinking and hiccuping and then it goes into the play. It goes back and forth. And so if one of the characters hiccups, it, the, the hiccups in there, it's really, really a funny way to learn history. And it's all true stories. Way. But, you know, but I was just thinking the fire could be part of that. Like they had the thing about the molasses. Remember the big molasses spill that happened? Um, yes. I think it was in Massachusetts. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. the flood of molasses. It's yeah, like, oh gosh, it's like you find these stories, you're like, who knew that? You know? Yeah. So yeah. It, why would you know that? <laughs> yeah. So like when you're going with the fire, it's like, okay, did this one happen? And that's interesting too, you know, the the state of things that kind of reminds me of the history of England with all the fires mm -hmm. that they had and the little kids mm -hmm. working in the mines and, you know, oh, yeah. and having to stand up. And, and I think that also goes from not only the rights to vote, but it also goes into how are the conditions of workers. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that goes to now too, you know, well, just, how um, even like there's one scene where Albert and I don't know if you had gotten there yet. Um, mm -hmm he tries to enlist in the army and he does not pass the physical because he worked in the factories for too long. Oh, cause it's breathing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. yeah. Really, like working in those factories was like akin to working in mine. I mean, it was yeah. just. And there was no protection for anybody back then. You know, no they, so many people had to die and, and so many doctors had to come forward right. and point the finger before anybody could change anything. So, and then the women were left out of the voting. So then it was just up to older men. <laughs> we probably didn't even know how many children they had. No, I'm kidding. Well, you got to think that we're not even part of the, you know, the constitution. They weren't part of the conversation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting. A lot of the reasons that men didn't want women to vote is because of prohibition. They were afraid that they were going to vote against alcohol. It's, it's, see, it's all carry nations. Women even cared about that. It's like the lobbyist firms of today. Yeah. It's, it's all business. They're like, you know, a lot of these laws are passed because they don't want business things to happen. So. But well, they had saloon girls. Well, the whole thing that went against <laughs> marijuana being legalized was all from the Hearst dude because he wanted to do some other kind of um, crop and hemp was, it was a rivalry. So he started the whole reefer madness thing. Mm. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow, yeah. <laughs> the business Alrighty, thing, then. Exactly, which has nothing to do with really the you know the, the root of why they're doing this. Mm, that's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. So yeah. now you've done all this research, right? And you geeked out. Like you, I, I'm like that. If I start and I'm like, oh, I can get this article out. I I've got it. And then I get into it and it's like, uh oh, here comes a big project. <laughs> you know, I remember one butterfly article Nancy turned into like mm -hmm. every butterfly species of the Southwest and every plant that they eat, like that kind of geeking mm -hmm. out thing. Do you see yourself writing more about women in history and, and the movement and, and doing it as a novel? Absolutely. So I'm already writing two novels. Um, oh, and again, I really credit my writing class. I go to writing class okay. every Monday, one to four. Cool. I mean, it's got to really be like a hurricane for me not to go. Oh, wow. Um, like I, I really, um, I love it. I've met a whole group of people I never would have met. Just so mm -hmm. I, it it's, means a lot to me in terms of my personal development. So I'm, I'm writing two novels. One is historical fiction and it's the women's viewpoint. And it's right now I'm playing around with the seventies. Um, mm. Just, ooh, hmm. Stepford Wives. Yeah, and, and, and there was, um, yeah. So I, you know, and I think with women and working, because that was a lot, you know, I actually saw, I was born in the seventies, but or I was born in um, 1970, but my, you know, I actually saw my mother start to work then and the role of women working, which to me again, deals with financial empowerment and independence. Yeah. So really the role of women working. Um, and I think that stands so much of what we do in our society. And again, it's the difference of women having to work versus choosing to work and making those choices. So, mm. so that's that, I'm playing around with that. I've written about, 10 chapters. And then the other is just an absolute contemporary novel. It's another feminist novel though. Um, so it's really a, a 20 something year old who goes to work in a financial firm and the choices she has to make around that. So. Oh, wow. So, so there's a lot of like moral and ethical yeah. stuff. That, I remember, that, uh, as I say, I remember when my mom demanded that she go get a job and my dad was absolutely not. And it was so weird to to realize that my mom, I mean, legally she could have gotten dead wood, done what she wanted to. She could have gone and got a job regardless of what my father said. But boom, when he said no, that was it. 
mm. that's off the table. Then a few months later, he became ill. And suddenly he changed his mind. Oh, you can go to work now. <laughs> you know? So there's, there's that, but that, that just, you know, no, absolutely not. End of discussion. It's like, wow. Mm -hmm. And the jobs that were available to them. Secretary and factory. At work. Now she went to work in a factory. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And that even today, like women are not at the C level. They're not at the CEO. They're not in management mm -hmm. committees. They're not advisory boards. They're not in the boards. It's a yeah, very small percentage and not getting the paycheck that they deserve, yeah. the salary. They're not getting, you know, they're, they're, there's, they're there's definitely exceptions to what I'm saying. So I shouldn't generalize, but, but I am. <laughs> but, but it's a real truth. And, but yeah. we are also seeing things drastically changed. I mean, and look at in, in women in the film industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're, we've got more women producing and directing and mm -hmm. owning full companies than we've ever had yeah you know so i think there's some positive changes but it should be in all industries and i also see a lot of women becoming entrepreneurs because it's the only way they can go forward well it's it's truthfully why i i worked in the banking area for about 10 years but i left it when i had children because i wanted to work but i knew that i wouldn't be able to be somewhat of a present mother and work mm -hmm. in a so I've always worked for myself since I've had children because I thought, well, this is the only way that I can still like maybe take my kids to school or if I want to take an afternoon mm. off or make dinner and, you know, be around for my children somewhat and still work. How can I do that really working mm. for a corporate setting? I just didn't see it. Mm. Mm. And now you're a writer. You've got My Money yeah. Matters. I like that title, by the way. That's yeah, 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 it's, it's, that. yeah. I like that. And now you're doing fiction, so that's got to be interesting. Going from one to the other, yeah, it's, it's doing nonfiction help help in regards to. I think with nonfiction, you 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 have to kind of get to the point, you know. And so when you're writing fiction, you need to kind of use those rules. <laughs> it's very different. I mean, it's so different. Like I wrote nonfiction for ten years. I wrote research when I worked on Wall Street. I wrote my money matters. I wrote articles for my my company, Down to Earth Finance, for gosh, you know, fifteen years. And then writing fiction, it's like, you know, everything you learned about nonfiction, erase it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right. ah. um, first of all, you can't even submit your book to an agent until the the fiction book is written in its entirety. Whereas yeah. nonfiction, I was able to just give a proposal, you know, just give a few sample chapters. So that process is different and. Um, you know, it's not that with nonfiction, you don't have a POV, but I feel like the POV and the, the point of view and the background of this character, and that's probably the area that I could do more with, is really like you just, you really want to focus on building this character and making them multifaceted, multidimensional. And mm. what were they thinking? What were they feeling? Why did they do this? How were they? And that's something that I had to train myself. I didn't know how to mm. do that. I didn't study English. I studied finance. So... Mm. That was really hard for me to learn how to write from the POV and just make it a multi-dimensional character because I think nonfiction yeah. is more facts oriented and you know and here's what to do, here's what not to do, and here's some like evidence behind it. And that's it. Let's yeah. move on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas with fiction and, and character development, it's like you have to jump into somebody else's body. It's almost like you have to be the actor, I right? Know, and a therapist. Make up a whole person and make them. Uh, stick to their character they can't be doing this and that well, well yes you know. you, right and show don't tell that was like the one thing that yeah. you have to do. show don't tell show don't tell so you have to come up with scenes and you have mm. to come up with dialogue and yeah. <laughs> because you know after a while I got good at it but in the beginning I was like I don't know how to write dialogue without saying well Lisa that is a very nice blouse that you're wearing like versus like, like thank you that blouse. Like, you know, have a British yeah. accent then <laughs> That's not yeah. conversational. Be like, Hello. oh, I like your blouse. Yeah. yeah, and there's that writing that, yeah, it's really difficult. It's, it's like food writing is one of the hardest things to do because you can't say yummy and delicious 20,000 times. Yeah. I mean, you can, it's fun to say, but you can't, you know? It's like you have to come up with different ways and metaphors, the umami. but the umami. the umami. Who's got the umami? <laughs> <laughs> I've got the mommy. You got the mommy. <laughs> but but um, when it comes to fiction writing, I think it's 
it's exciting because you do connect with characters. A lot of authors we talk to, you know, say that the character is telling them what to do. It's like, you think you're going to do this with the mm-hmm. story. You have this outline of what you're doing with the book. And then the character just like, wake up. It's time to go write. I've got this other thing you're going to do instead. Do you get any of that happening to you? She took on her own personality without, yeah. a, doubt, without a doubt. I actually... Um, she doesn't die, but at one point I thought about, did she die? Because there was also the flu epidemic of 1918, mm. which oh, was yeah. huge. I mean, it's sadly similar to what we're living through right now. And so I thought, well, do I make Helen die? And I was like, I can't do that. Like, I really like freaked out. I was like, what, am, what was I thinking? I can't make her die. And I'm like, wait, she's not really a real person. Like, but it was, I thought I had that very visceral mm. reaction um, about that. Um, and then I'm not kidding you. I had a friend of mine who was in my writing class and she texted me. She said, I, I was in New York city the other day and I saw Helen. No, no. She's like, I saw her walking down the street. I was like, and I took that as such a That's compliment. Cool. Yeah. Like she had come in a photo. Yeah. <laughs> she, well, like she saw someone who reminded her of Helen and, you know, hearing me write for a year. And I was like, why, thank you. I felt it was such a compliment. No, that's cool. That but that is cool. Character because, is alive. Yeah, yeah because I, I think that's the other yeah. part of it. A really good book gets you to your co-creating. Your, you have those visions, you know. It's good to have a movie. And, and if the movie comes out, mm-hmm. it needs to be good and not ruin it. You know what I mean? Because I always find the books better majority oh, of the time. 100%. 100%. You know, like, and uh, yeah. The details. And, and you have it in your own head. You've got, you've developed your image, you know. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. I would love to see, you know, people read, you get 10 people to read your book and then have a sketch artist, like the crime sketch artist come in and, and <laughs> sketch what everybody does, you know. Right, yeah. right, what Helen really looks like or yeah. what Helen looks like. But or- you have that, yeah, you have that, everyone will identify with a different part of her. Right. Yeah. You know, which is the cool part of it. Well, I'm glad you're going to continue reading. That's what yeah, Nancy's like. The beginning of she's like, holy crap, you wouldn't believe what she's how she started this, you know. And really, like Nancy, <laughs> get to the end because the end will yeah. shock you. There's something that happens in the end that is absolutely true. I oh, mean, I will, I will definitely yes. do yeah. that. I will shock you. you. You cannot, I did not know about it. I learned about Seeing it. Seeing that's, that's where the character shocking. takes on their life, and then all of a sudden it's out of your control. You're it really, it really notes. Yeah. You're taking notes, and they're saying, You just you should write it this way. She reminds me right now. Uh, she really reminds me of my grandmother. I love that. Just that little spitfire. And I remember once when um, I was staying because I I got, was sick as a kid for like a whole year, mm. and so I stayed at my aunt's, stayed at my grandmother's, stayed at home, and they they kept shifting me around. And my grandmother came home in a pantsuit, and. My grandfather took one look. He didn't say one word. He went to his, they had separate bedrooms. He went to his bedroom and closed the door and he didn't come out till the next day. Just because she wore a pantsuit. He was so you know, about it. It, it, it is so weird. When, and in your book makes you think back to little things like that, that I saw growing up, the, the attitude of men, um, it, you know, it's like he, he lost, he lost control there. He lost a little control over her. Because she went there, she spent the money, she came home, and it was a, a, a light yellow, and she had a little jacket on with a little dicky under the jacket, and then her, her pants. And she was so proud of him. She kept twisting around, looking in the mirror. She goes, what do you think? What do you think? You know, and, it, and the people have been wearing pantsuits for a bit longer, but for her, was the first time and she's so proud of it and he was so angry oh my gosh wow it, you know what i mean that wasn't that long ago yeah mm-hmm. it wasn't Mm-mm. no, no yeah. it's, it's wild when you think it's about funny. all the changes women have had mm-hmm. to go through i mean you should just write a big book on women's changes like you know it's funny you say it because when i started my career in wall street like we weren't mm-hmm. it was unwritten but we and this is in the 90s like we weren't really mm-hmm. supposed to wear pants we were always oh, wear, that's right. The banking. Yeah. <gasps> the hell, the banking. We were kind of, yeah. You know, like if I wore a pantsuit. They were like, oh, is it casual Friday? Oh. Like, or if and I didn't wear heels or if I wore, if I didn't wear hose. Pantyhose. And like, you couldn't wear um, glasses without sleeves. Sleeveless. Yeah. Oh, no, you, you had to wear a jacket. Like, you know, yeah. you had to wear a suit. Like you. Yeah. Um, which, you know, men did too, but it was just more, you're right. You couldn't, like, I remember once yeah. in the summer because it was, and I was in New York city. So I was taking the subway, which was air conditioned, but the subway platform wasn't. 
and I had a tank top, like it was a nice tank top, but it was a tank top, you know, sleeveless mm -hmm. under my jacket. And I think I took it off. I walked in the office with it just on and people were like, what are you wearing? You know, mm -hmm. it's like, oh yeah, well, you... it's 95 degrees out with humidity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's funny. Cause you know, just, I have a friend who um, was in the tourism industry and her boss at the time is now retired and moved on and probably good for that. She made them, and this is in the South, mm -hmm. she made them wear nylons yeah. and high heels and oh. forced them all to have the long fingernail thing yes. and yeah. wear like the mm -hmm. blazer thing. And you're in the South and you're talking about the heat, like that humidity. Right. I was it's like, so who? Hot. how can you even wear nylons? I mean, no. oh, the, I don't even know how to wear like anything nasty. with a heel unless it's like my hiking boots. No, I, don't, I, mean, I don't own nylons I don't own tights like I don't know I mean I own tights for warmth but that's it but it yeah the be... nylons I remember doing that and always getting a run in them and then I thought oh well, that's yeah. fun that's and my new style <laughs> and you painted nail polish remember yeah. to stop the run <laughs> I know. Really? oh gosh yeah but we absolutely when I first started working at the automobile club you absolutely had to wear heels you absolutely had to have painted manicured fingernails you absolutely had to have your hair up and you absolutely had to wear nylons but you could not wear black ones you well that's wear... enough of that you know yeah. mm -hmm. none of the fishnet thingies no no black ones you had to wear tan nylons oh my god <laughs> yeah and then pantyhose came in first you started with those stupid little girdle thingies with those I don't know what you call them, garter belt thingies. Oh my gosh. I know. And they have this oh my gosh. things. I'm really dating myself. <laughs> I know. I know. The, the nylons were connected to these little metal things that held them up while you walked in. It was like, Ooh. Mm. Now they're in eggs, those little egg things. Yeah, but oh in. my gosh! All right, so yeah, you've got to you've got to write a book of changes and fashions, women's fashions. Just go to a museum and look at women's clothes, it's like from back, way back then, like the whalebone corset and all that. Yeah, we've yeah. come a long way. But yeah. um, thank you so Not much yet. for joining us. It has been. Oh my gosh! Fun... Thank you, Lisa Nancy. This has been one of the funnest interviews. <laughs> I think we've, really we've, we've we've talked about all kinds of things, uh, but yeah. you know, it's it's all important. And sorry, I've got a dog that's, you know, yes. wanting to play, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, it's been my I, honor to be here. So uh, it's you. been a true pleasure. Uh, everyone, Galia, uh oh. oh now, keep oh, on. <laughs> John, and it's the accidental suffragist. Go to yes. Galia .com. That's G I C H O N. Galia, G I C H O N. Uh, Gishon author.com and of course keep up with us at bigblendradio.com uh, we air Monday through Friday so thank you so much for joining thank us it's been good. a blast